Hello and welcome to Lecture 11, where we'll talk about digital modulation or digital bandpass modulation. So this is essentially the equivalent of lectures 2 to, se two to 6, but now we're talking about digital versions. So digital AM and digital FM and digital PM. So last lecture, we spoke about digitization sampling and quantization. We um, spoke about the Nyquist rate again. We introduced different types of pulse modulation. We spoke briefly about pulse modulation, about line coding. We introduced pulse code modulation, and we spent some time talking about channel capacity and the Shannon-Hartley theorem. Today, we're going to be looking at digital modulation. So we, I use the word bandpass to distinguish it from um, baseband. So in lecture 10, we looked at pulse modulation, which was baseband. Now we're looking at bandpass modulation. So this is where we actually have a carrier. So this is generally going to be wireless communication. Okay, so we're going to talk about modulation, demodulation, and a little bit about the frequency domain representation. We'll then look a little bit at um, uh, versions of amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and phase modulation, where we have multiple levels. We refer to this as m -re. And... Um, this will lead us nicely to our final lecture where we'll talk about multiplexing. So where are we? We are right here, lecture 11. There's one lecture to go, mm. and after that we have our class test on the 12th of May. A few things to say about that class test. It's worth 15% of your module, you know that. It's scheduled at 10 a.m. on the 12th of May. If you can't make it for that time, if you're unable to access the test at that time, if you know that in advance, let me know. Okay, if you can't make it for this time, let me know. Okay, you may be entitled... Um, uh, to claim extenuating circumstances, you need to make that known to myself and to the office ahead of time. Okay, there's no point telling me after the exam or after the test. Now, another thing to note is that it's a two hour test. Okay, it's not just a one hour test, it's a two hour test. Um, there are a total of 15 questions, and there are two parts to the test there's a part A and a part B. Part A looks like what you've seen before. So it's sort of a canvas test with numerical and multiple choice um, submissions or solutions. So multiple choice and numerical. So it's similar to the kind of test you had um, back in, in March. So similar to test one. But there's also a part B. Now, for part B, there are handwritten solutions. Okay, so here I will expect you to either plot a sketch or to write an expression um, or to um, explain something. Okay, so this is a different format, something you're not, um, you're, you're, not, you're not accustomed to, and it won't be using your, your familiar format on Canvas. So for that, I've put together a little demo, and you know, the, I expect you to spend some time um, uh, trying this demo out, okay, just to see if your computer can support it, and if you're able to interact with these different styles of questions. Okay, so you have two hours in total. 
So one hour for each part. So one hour for part A and one hour for part B. The way it's um, structured is that the exam, the test starts at 10 a.m. You have an 11 a.m. deadline for completing part A and a 12 p.m. deadline for completing part B. Okay, so if you finish part A early, that will give you more time for part B. But you shouldn't need an hour. Part B is only five questions and you shouldn't need an hour. So two hours should be plenty. If you have a support plan, then you will have extra time for part A only. Okay, for part B, the time is um, the same for everyone. So back to lecture 11. So now we've digitized our data. Now we have data that's been sampled, quantized, and encoded. We want to transmit it. We've already looked at baseband transmission. So baseband transmission is where you have a cable and you're trying to transmit along a cable. And we've, we've looked at that and we've spoken about data centers, undersea cable, fiber optic cables, PCM, regenerative repeaters, and all that. Now we're going to look at bandpass modulation. So bandpass modulation, this is where you have a radio wave carrier. So wireless. Okay, so when I say radio wave, I include microwave. Okay, so we're now talking about wireless communication. Now there's, I, I've put together a short little, um, short little video from a, um, from a YouTube clip online. The link to the original clip is in my PowerPoint on uh, Canvas. I, I suggest you watch that if you want the whole, the whole video clip. But I've put together a, a few minutes just to set uh, the scene, give you some context and introduce you to what we'll be talking about for the rest of this lecture. So let's discuss the digital modulation techniques that are currently used. More specifically, let's see how the digital bit flow is converted to an electromagnetic wave. The first digital technique is amplitude shift keying. Here, based on the digital pulses, the amplitude of the carrier signal is adjusted. High amplitude relates to 1 and low amplitude relates to 0. The next technique is called frequency shift keying. Here, based on the value of digital pulses, the frequency of the carrier signal is adjusted. In this case, high frequency relates to 1 and low frequency relates to 0. The third technique is phase shift keying. Here, the phase of the carrier signal is changed by 180 degrees when the digital pulse moves from 1 to 0 or 0 to 1. Telecommunications technology is all about increasing data transfer speed and efficiency. But if you use any of the digital modulation techniques explained previously, you wouldn't get a high data transfer speed. However, there is a technique in physics which, if you use it, means you can practically send up to six bits of information as a single electromagnetic wave. This technique is known as quadrature amplitude modulation. In the case of digital QAM, a similar approach is used. Here, instead of analog signals, different combinations of bits are added together to produce a multiplexed signal. Let's see how a 16 QAM works. If you are familiar with digital technology, you know that any form of data is just a collection of ones and zeros. In 16 QAM, we can pack four bits together and send it as a single electromagnetic wave. Based on the values of the four bits, this output will have different phase angles and amplitude. This means the phase angle and amplitude of the multiplexed signal can completely represent four bits of data. In 16 QAM, such 16-bit values can be represented by adjusting the phase and amplitude of the multiplexed signal and this single multiplexed signal 
is then used for the transmission. You can see how the different amplitude and phase electromagnetic signals represent various four bits of data. So you see, when we have digital modulation, essentially we're doing the same as we did with analog modulation. We take a carrier at the transmitter and then we superimpose upon that high frequency carrier our message and our message happens to be digital. So we modulate the carrier with our digital information. So this information just happens to be digital. And at the receiver, we reverse that and we demodulate. So really all we're trying to do is modify, so you've seen this uh, diagram before, we're trying to modify or change some characteristic of our signal. So what are the characteristics that we can change? Well, there are only three things we can change. We can either change the amplitude or the frequency or the phase of our carrier. We can try um, doing combinations of those. We can change the amp frequency and uh, phase. We can change the frequency and the amplitude, but most commonly what we do is we change the amplitude and phase. So that's the amplitude and phase. So the rest of this lecture is really just about how we do it and what we call it. So the three things we do are amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, and phase modulation. And we add these words, we say it's amplitude shift keying, frequency shift keying, and phase shift keying, um, and you, you'll see why in a second. So you have your data, this is after sampling, quantization, and encoding, you have your data, for example, 101, and you superimpose that on your high frequency carrier. So this is a, an illustrative e example. It's a bit exaggerated. The frequency isn't that high. So here you can see that when you have a zero, you have nothing. But when you have a one, you have a burst of high frequency carrier. That's amplitude modulation, basically. So that's amplitude shift keying. In frequency shift keying, you have a high frequency when you have a 1 and a lower frequency when you have a 0. And in, frequency sh in phase shift keying, you have a phase change. So you have one phase for a 1 and the opposite phase for a 0. So you end up with these phase changes. So that's a little summary and now for a little bit more detail. So when we say amplitude shift keying, I've added another word here, binary. So binary amplitude shift keying is where we only have two levels, a 1 and a 0. Because, you know, in digital data doesn't have to be a series of 1s and zeros. But if we're only looking at 1 and 0, if we have binary, um, then we're only going to have two levels. And if we use those two levels and we simply multiply our high frequency carrier by uh, a suitable line encoded signal, so this signal is after line encoding, then you end up with a signal here where, again, your data is encoded within the envelope of the product. So this looks very much like DSB. Okay, so it's just AM. It's amplitude modulation, but digital. But because we have nothing, we have zero whenever there's a zero being transmitted, and we have a burst of carrier when there's a one. So it means we have carrier, no carrier, carrier, no carrier. That is if our data just happens to look like that. So we also refer to this as on-off keying because it's on, then off, on, then off. Now, obviously, if we had 
a different data stream like one 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 zero one zero one one this would vary accordingly but it still turns on and off depending on whether the um, digital data is one or a zero so we call that on off keying so that's your ASK or binary amplitude shift keying now for frequency shift keying again we're looking at binary frequency shift keying so that's where we have two levels here the information isn't encoded in the amplitude it's encoded in the frequency so we have a low frequency high frequency low frequency high frequency so the in this case the low frequency corresponds to a one and the high frequency corresponds to zero one zero one zero so it looks a little bit like ASK or it looks like the combination of two ASKs and we'll look at why and how that is uh, in a few minutes so that was frequency shift keying or binary frequency shift keying for phase shift keying, again, we're looking at phase shift keying for two levels. Here, what we have is depending on whether we have a one or a zero, we either have one phase or the opposite phase. So we have a 180 degree or pi radian shift in phase every time we have a change from 1 to 0. Okay, so we have a two phases, either 0 degrees or 180 degrees of pi radians. So this is one way of doing phase shift keying. There are variants that you need to know of. We have something called differentially coded PSK. So instead of BPSK or just PSK, we have something called DPSK, differentially coherent PSK. And here, what we're encoding is the phase change. So whenever we have a one in the digital data stream, that translates into a phase change. So the change the phase shifts every time there is a 1. When there is a 0, then there is no change in phase. So here we can tell whether our data stream contained 1s or zeros based on whether we detect changes in phase or not. So this is called DPSK. So we're not encoding the data in the phase, we're encoding it in the phase changes. So a quick comparison based on what we've seen already. ASK is simple in terms of modulation and demodulation, low bandwidth, I'll show you why in a separate second, and it's susceptible f to interference for the same reasons that um, amplitude modulation or analog amplitude modulation was also su susceptible to interference and to noise. So, Frequency shift keying requires a larger bandwidth, you can probably imagine why, Again, FM also required a greater bandwidth than AM, but we'll look at the reasons why in a minute. And frequency shift keying, as you can imagine, is uh, more complex at both ends, meaning at the transmitting and the receiving ends, but it is more robust against interference and um, uh, also has... Uh, a lower bit error rate. 
So let's look at how we actually modulate. So when we talk about generation, we're talking about modulation. So remember when we spoke about analog modulation, we introduced the properties, we looked at power, we looked at modulation, demodulation, and spectral requirements. But we're going to do all of that in half an hour for digital modulation. So have you seen a diagram like that before? Well, it looks a lot like a DSB modulator. Okay, it's almost exactly like a DSB modulator. So what you have is a local carrier. That's your local oscillator. And that's generating your high frequency signal. And that's multiplied by your um, line coded digital data. And that gives you your ASK signal. It really couldn't be simpler than that. Now, if we're going to look at the bandwidth requirements or the frequency domain version of this, what you have here is the product of a rectangular wave multiplied by um, a high frequency carrier. And in the frequency domain, that's like a convolution between a pair of impulses and a sync function. So this convolution of a sync function with a pair of impulses gives you a spectrum that looks like this. So you've got your sync function centered at FC and you'll have another one centered at minus FC. And I think it's useful to note that this is your bandwidth. So your ASK bandwidth will be similar to your bit rate. Okay, so it'll be in, be in the order of n times the sampling rate. Okay, so for every bit per second, you're going to need one hertz of bandwidth. So this bandwidth is in the order of approximately your bit rate, NFS. Now you can imagine if we had to demodulate this, so they're talking about detection, so this is demodulation. So at the other end, and again, we're looking at non-coherent. Where have we seen that word before? So non-coherent detection, that means we're not using a local oscillator. Remember, we spoke about envelope detection. So this is a version of envelope detection for a um, uh, for a digital AM signal. So we're simply using a diode rectifier, but we also need some kind of comparator in order to convert this output of the filter to our digital data, because in the end, this is what we're after. We're after the digital data from, wh from where this originally came from. Why doesn't this look nice and clean like we agreed that ASK should look like? What, why, is it, why does it look so strange? Well, remember, this is after the signal has traveled through the channel. So we have a wireless propagation channel and then the signal will arrive here. So it will have suffered from the effects of noise, 
distortion, attenuation, interference, etc. Then it goes into your recovery circuit and then we try to recover our original data. Is this perfect? Is this data um, uh, exactly the same as our original uh, digital data? It might be, but often it isn't. It's corrupted by uh, errors. And these errors result in something called a bit error rate. And we'll, we'll speak a little bit about the bit error rate next lecture. So that was non-coherent detection, similar to an envelope detector. Now we're going to talk about coherent detection. Remember, coherent detection is where we have a locally generated carrier. So this is also known as synchronous. detection or synchronous demodulation. Okay, so where have we seen this before? We saw this, the DSB suppressed carrier. And what does it consist of? Well, it consists of a local carrier, multiplier, and a low-pass filter. The only thing we've added here is this comparator. Why have we done that? It's so that we can have our crisp data, our digital data recovered. So there's some kind of sampling and thresholding going on. That's what our comparator does to produce our digital data. So it looks almost exactly like a DSB demodulator. We just add that comparator. Now, that was ASK. FSK is almost exactly the same. You can imagine that our FSK signal is simply the sum of two ASK signals. So if you have a digital bit stream that looks like this, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, then if you take your zeros or your, your ones, let's... Let's, let's start with the ones. If you take your ones and you use an ASK modulator using a, um, uh, a frequency, let's call it F1, then that will give you this bit of your signal. And if you use a different frequency, F2, to generate another ASK signal, but this time you're generating it from the inverse of these. So you need to take um, you need to take this data stream and invert it in order to generate this. So whenever there's a one here, there will be a zero here. And whenever there's a zero here, there's a one here. A one here would be a zero there. Okay, so these two, one represents the data and one represents um, not the data. Then they're added together and you end up with this composite signal. Now this is your FSK signal. Now in practice, we don't generate our FSK that way, but you can imagine that our FSK is simply two ASK signals added together with this important um, NOT gate. And the reason I'm suggesting you look at it this way is because it helps you to visualize how we demodulate FSK. So this is um, generation of FSK. In practice, this is often done using a switch. Now, if we did have a switch, we'd have two frequencies, F1 and F2. Here it's omega 1 and omega 2. 
we would have these um, phase discontinuities because of the switching. In practice, what we actually have is a voltage-controlled oscillator, so that rather than switching between two discrete frequencies, what we have is an oscillator that will change its frequency depending on the amplitude of the input. And here we have a better version of this without the discontinuities. So you can imagine that this is how AS, FSK is generated. In practice, it's generated like that, which is just a better way of doing that. Now, again, what we always do is look at generation and detection. Detection is just another way of saying demodulation. And again, we're looking at non-coherent, so we're looking at asynchronous. So no carrier at the um, receiver. So here you have your FSK signal. And here we have two filters. What kind of filters are these? These are bandpass filters. And they're tuned to F1 and F2. So one will be tuned to this frequency and one will be tuned to that frequency. What do you think these are? That just looks like a rectifier followed by a low-pass filter or a smoothing circuit. So it's basically an um, a, uh, envelope detector. So you can think of it as two ASK detectors. And then we have a comparator to check is the output greater at this end or this end? So we know whether we had a 1 or a 0. Okay, so if we imagine FSK as being uh, a composite signal formed by two ASK signals, then you can imagine the detection of FM can happen simply by detecting two streams of ASK after filtering using two frequency. So these would be the carrier frequencies used for the ones and the zeros. Now, PSK is slightly less easy, but um, generation of PSK. So this is a PSK modulator. What does this look like? It looks very much like a DSB modulator. So simply multiplying our input signal our message, digital line encoded in this case, with our high frequency carrier. And that will give us that. It looks a bit like ASK, but it's not on off keying. So you've got something for a one and something for a zero. The, the difference, so rather than having nothing for a zero, it's because here, rather than having a signal that looks like this, where you have zero, this time you don't have zero, you have a, a, a positive or a negative. So the positive gives you one phase, the negative gives you another phase. So you end up with this 180 degree or pi radian phase and a zero degree phase depending on whether you have a one or a zero being transmitted so you have these phase shifts so that's PSK now whether it's DPSK or BPSK there can be different variations on this signal or on this block diagram and how this exactly represents or how it relates to our data. So the trick was to use a bipolar digital message so that you don't have zeros. So what we always want to do, remember in our very first lecture we said one of the characteristics 
or the desirable characteristics of a communication system is that we have a high data throughput. That's another way of saying fast data transmission. We want to transmit a lot of data in a short amount of time. So to maximize data throughput, what we want to do is to transmit as much information in as short a time as possible. So that often means we want to transmit more than one bit at a time. So is it possible to transmit two bits or more using the same portion of carrier? So thinking about ASK, we spoke about BPSK where we have two levels. What if we had four levels? Then we would have four ASK. So instead of saying BPSK, where B represents binary, we would say, f sorry, instead of saying um, BASK, where the B represents binary, we would have four ASK or four level ASK. So four levels will require two bits. So two bits per digital symbol. So our symbol will consist of two bits. So two bits could be zero, zero, could be zero, one, could be one, zero, could be one, one. So these, this is our alphabet of four possible symbols. One, two, three, four different symbols. So four different levels. So that's one level, that's another level, that's another level, and that's another level. That's, these are our four levels. So rather than have on-off keying, where you have a burst of carrier for a one and no carrier for a zero, this time it looks a little bit closer to AM, doesn't it? It looks like a DSB with a large carrier, so we, it looks like we have the message encoded in the envelope. So it looks like AM. The spectrum is probably going to look like AM. We're going to have a carrier component, We're probably going to have sidebands, an upper sideband, and a lower sideband. But the advantage is that now we can transmit uh, data uh, twice as fast. We can do something similar with um, phase as well. So we're able to encode two bits using QPSK. So depending on what our symbol is, again, same symbols, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. So we have an alphabet of four symbols, just like we had our four symbols here. And the result is the same. We have twice the symbol rate. So the board rate is just another way of saying the symbol rate. And the data rate is twice the board rate. So we have twice as many bits per second as we have symbols per second. What we can also do is combine amplitude and phase into something called QAM, or Quadrature Amplitude Modulation. Now this is a really um, useful way to increase the data throughput, or the data rate, even further. Because we use eight different phases, not just four, and two different amplitudes. If you multiply the two, that gives you 16 different symbols. So four bits. So we have zero, 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 one, all the way to one, 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 one. So four bits, 16 symbols. Where do we use this? Well, it's used in mobile communications. It's used in broadband. It's used in some types of satellite communications. We'll look at that in a minute. But it comes with a big advantage and a disadvantage. So it comes at the cost of um, an increased error rate, but it allows you to transmit um, 
uh, four times more data um, per second compared to binary versions of amplitude modulation or phase modulation. So well, you need to know some of the applications of these. So where do we use ASK? ASK is used for um, infrared modulation. So things like television remotes. Okay, so relatively low frequencies. FSK used to be used so for dial-up internet. So you might remember, might have seen on TV, old internet connections where we used telephone lines. So the kind of modulation we used, because the telephone lines weren't designed for internet, they weren't designed for high-speed uh, data. They were intended for voice communication, so they had to be adapted um, for use for dial-up internet. So we used something called audio FSK. Nowadays, FSK, you'll only come across it in things like caller ID on your um, uh, wired landline, or it, it, it's part of Bluetooth. So Bluetooth isn't FSK, but FSK is involved in Bluetooth communications. PSK is much more common so if you if you ever used wi-fi or enhanced gsm then psk is a big part of that now qam is um so quadrature amplitude modulation what we spoke about before and qpsk that is involved in um, gps mobile satellite comms um etc so um a lot of 4G and parts of 5G um, involve um, QPSK and QAM. So that brings us to the end of today's lecture. So we've spoken about different types of amplitude, frequency and phase modulation. So digital bandpass modulation. We spoke about how it's generated, how it's detected, and a little bit about what they look like in the frequency domain. We spoke about MRE, ASK, PSK, QPSK, and QAM. And we'll look at multiple access and multiplexing in our next uh, and final lecture. So just as a reminder, we are now here. That was lecture 11. Lecture 12 is our final lecture, and the test is on the 12th of May. So I hope you found that helpful. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, make sure you stay safe.